Okay. Hello, this is Dane Cialino and Ernie Svensson, and welcome to our first session on uh, Introduction to Modern Lawyering. This, as the slide would suggest, is, is our first uh, overview of all of the sessions of the course. Uh, and it gives us an opportunity to take a step back and, and give you some, kind of, uh, some broader perspectives on what we hope to accomplish over the next 20 some odd sessions. And I'm Ernie Svensson. I um, will be participating in this session with Dane today. Uh, my background is I've practiced law for 27 years, most of that in a mid-sized firm in New Orleans doing commercial litigation. And then for the last six years or so, practicing as a solo lawyer. Um, trying of course. Uh, and it gives us an opportunity to take a step back and, and give you some, kind of, uh, some broader perspectives on what we hope to accomplish over the next 20 some odd sessions. Oh, that's weird. Where was that coming from, Arnie? All right, Dane, you there? I'm here. Hello, Dane. Hold on a second. I'm here. Did you have another window open with it to hang out on? D yeah, Dane, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so I'm going to use my, my headphones because that creates a problem for some reason when I use this the the amp. So we're just, so let's let's start over because I'm going to trim this part out. And so what we're going to do is just start. We're going to I'm going to put your slide first. So you introduce yourself, then we'll introduce me, and then we'll move on. Okay. Okay. All right. So here we go. Good. From the top. Yep. Okay. Hello, this is Dane Cialino, and I, along with Ernie Svensson, are here to give you uh, our introduction to modern lawyering. This is the first session of uh, some 20-odd sessions that will comprise the course. And in this session, Ernie and I hope to give you kind of a broad general overview, of not only of what we intend to, uh, to discuss during the course, but also kind of a big picture of how we view lawyering to have changed with the advent or the development really of, of modern lawyering technologies. I'm Dane Cialino. I am a professor of law at Loyola. I've been a full-time professor there since 1995. Uh, before that I was a lawyer at Cravath Swain and Moore in New York City and Stone Pigman in New Orleans. I uh, at Loyola teach principally the legal ethics course but also teach a number of other doctrinal courses uh, in addition to this course on law and litigation management. I, I blog at Louisiana at LALegalEthics.org uh, and uh, I uh, am the author of a book on Louisiana legal ethics. You can reach me at Dane at DaneCielino.com at any point during the course or, or thereafter if you have questions about ethics issues or about law and technology uh, related problems. Ernie? And I'm Ernie Svensson. I practiced law in New Orleans for 27 years with a mid-sized New Orleans firm and did commercial litigation for most of that time. For the last six years I've practiced as a solo lawyer also doing commercial litigation and was able to make that switch largely because I was good at using technology in the ways that we're going to be talking about in this course. I recently wrote a book called Acrobat and One Hour for Lawyers to help lawyers understand how to use PDFs better in their practice have a website called paperlesschase.com where help lawyers uh, learn how to shed paper and get more organized using technology. And this is my email address here if, um, if you need to get in touch with me. So uh, we're going to talk about how technology affects the practice of law, but of course technology affects modern life to begin with and, to, and its effect on the practice of law is just sort of a corollary of that and I, I know a lot of lawyers think well I don't really care about technology but the fact is technology is basically just tools and so the most powerful computers um, the most powerful tools we have today are computers and and other digital kinds of tools so it's computers and the software that run on computers that are changing the way that everybody in the modern world 
uh, lives, and that includes computers. So we live in an era of, um, of transmitting, managing information, and so forth. And so the question really is, how are we going to use these tools to do a better job, to be more effective with our clients? Okay, And that's what we are really going to focus on today. It's basically the concept that we live in the information age, so we have to take advantage of things in the information age and let go of things that were from the bygone era of the industrial age, which had mechanical parts that broke down and were um, annoying to take care of. And, and I think we would submit to you that, that for lawyers, this transition uh, into the use of digital technology to facilitate their work is going to be easy and more logical than uh, virtually any other profession. Accounting maybe uh, is a bit different. A doctor, for example, has got to lay hands on a patient, uh, at least many doctors. A blacksmith has got to be able to kind of work with the, with the iron at, at, at his uh, uh, foundry. But lawyers deal only with information. And information can be stored in paper format, on chiseled tablets, and in digital format. So since all we're doing is producing, analyzing, managing, communicating information, ideas, that uh, we as a group, as a profession, are really uh, well poised to take advantage of this technology. Yeah, and, and this is something I didn't really think about when I practiced, I mean, when I started practicing long out of law school because the focus wasn't on computers. We didn't have computers per se. And the idea was really just learn how to use forms, learn how to look things up in books, and so forth. And it didn't really dawn on me that any of this was, you know, on the horizon. But once I started messing with computers, and once I started seeing some of the things that I could do with them, I realized that, you know, the, the, I, the key was to improve my workflow process as a lawyer, and that meant taking things that I had done in a in an analog or mechanical kind of way and tried to think about well how would I leverage this if, I, if I'm using computers and the process of leveraging computers is no different than the process of leveraging machinery I mean basically you're looking at what are the kinds of things that I'm doing that are routine that are kind of mindless that can be automated um, what are the kinds of things that I do that occur in a certain sequence that it's predictable and if so, if it's digital, can I automate that or at least batch process it in a manual way? And what are the kinds of things that require specialized knowledge? And if I drill in and learn this one kind of task in a really clear, focused way, the odds are I will see ways to automate, batch process, refine, and so forth. And that's really, you know, and that's what Henry Ford did when he created the assembly line. He took these mechanical processes and figured out how to make them more efficient. And, and so forth. So we're just doing the same thing. We're not trying to use these, these tools just because they're cool. We're trying to use them because they can help us get things done. So the, really, the big question here is how are we going to make sensible use of this technology? Right? And that, that's a, a, a good question because a lot of times uh, people, and, and I am one of these people, will go out and get a piece of technology, a new gadget or gizmo, and not really know what I'm going to do with it, but just know that I want it because it's new and shiny. I'm not discouraging that. It's a waste of money, I know. But it, it is not productive necessarily. What we hope to do is to help you identify those uh, technological resources, and I use that term uh, in a way that means both software and hardware and Internet resources, to uh, to really help you, not just to say, uh, gee whiz, look, I can do this with no paper, but to really do it in a way that makes you a better lawyer and a more efficient lawyer. And that's what this is really all about. Right, because the goal here, I mean, the, the thing is, good lawyers solve problems. They're good problem solvers. They're good at asking questions. They're good at figuring out what's going on. And, and technology is not going to ask questions for you. It's not going to solve the problems for you. But it can assist you if part of the process involves looking for information so that you understand 
better how to solve the problem or what the ingredients of the problem are. In the case of litigation, that would be, you know, what are the underlying facts, who did what to who, when, how, and so forth. Um, and that information is what's going to help you solve the problem. That information is, what, is what's going to tell you what the next logical question to ask is. So, you, you know, obviously you need to know how to practice law, and you're learning that, or you've learned that already, and um, the question is really just how do you use these tools to do a better job? So one of the things that we recommend folks do, um, whether they're starting straight out of law school or not, is consult some useful resources. And this is a resource that Dane and I think is, is pretty good, written by a fellow who's in Nevada who started a solo practice straight out of law school. And I think this book is actually applicable to anyone who's practicing law, whether it's for another firm or what have you, because it's basically talking about developing the um, self-reliance and initiative to solve the problems related to how you build a practice uh, in the first place. Yeah, and this is, a, this, this is, as I already said, a good book. Uh, it, it is a book that, uh, I've, it's, a, it's a short book, so for those of us with a short attention span, and that includes me, it, uh, it's not uh, uh, verbose. It gets to the point, and it really it looks at the practice of law from a very practical standpoint and from the standpoint of someone who's a young lawyer and who did go out on, an, on his own and practice law and, and, and kind of learn on the fly. So this is a book that we are asking everybody taking the course to, to get. The link for it is, uh, is on Amazon. You can, you can buy the book. For a law book, it's reasonably cheap. Uh, it's only 30 some odd dollars, although it's published by one of the leading law book manufacturers. So, uh, so we ask everybody to get the book and to, uh, and to read it. Now, again, it's not the perfect book, the only book. There are other books that, uh, that we've recommended in the past, like, for example, a book uh, by uh, an author named Foonberg, sold on the ABA website, is, uh, is quite a good book. But, uh, but just for a change of pace, uh, we are, are now, uh, in this course, going to use the Benikoff book. Right. So basically, the idea is once you have an idea of what a successful law practice looks like if you're a new lawyer, then you can figure out what technology to use to help you save time, money, you know, do a better job, and collaborate more easily. In other words, not always have to go to the office. So that's one part. Now, the other big part that's going to run throughout this entire course is the idea of shedding as much paper as possible and practicing what Dane and I called paperless lawyering. Uh, we both believe that the modern lawyer really needs to minimize their reliance on paper and not get trapped into an inefficient and expensive world of managing paper uh, because the information contained in it is all you really want, not the paper, but if you manage paper, it's going to cost you a lot of uh, time, money, and it's going to result in aggravation. So the key is to learn to work with information in PDF format. So, yeah, and, and I, this, this whole paperless er, uh, lawyering theme that Ernie mentioned, uh, Ernie says that we believe in paperless lawyering. I would like to think our belie it, it, we're firmer uh, in our <laughs> resolve than that. I mean, we believe and we preach as if it were gospel that paperless lawyering is not a way of lawyering. It is the way of lawyering in the future. And I, as I said, firmly believe that and am uh, evangelical about it. Note that we are pushing this as we speak across the Internet. So th this is an overarching theme that, that, that lawyering must be paperless. And by paperless, we mean near 100% paperless. And that is one of the overarching uh, themes of the course. Right. And the starting point for any paperless lawyer is, you tell them, Ernie. Well, it's uh, PDFs and it's Adobe Acrobat. Um, you have to, we're, we're actually going to start, so Adobe makes a couple of different products, well they make lots of products, but related to PDFs, they make a product called Adobe Reader. Adobe Reader is a free program that most people probably have on their computer because you have to download it, install it, so that you can read PDF files when you come across them, and um, it will even display them in your computer browser. So most people have Adobe Reader, but if you ask lawyers, do you have Adobe Acrobat, they tend to say yes when they really don't have it because they think that the Adobe Reader program is Adobe Acrobat. It's not. So when I mentioned that book that I wrote earlier, um, that book is about how you can use Adobe Acrobat 
um, in your law practice. And it's a great book. It's got lots of screenshots. It took me a long time to write it. I got a lot of great input from folks like Dane and others, you know, who practice law, who helped me make it better. So that's a great book when we get to Adobe Acrobat. But we're going to start with Adobe Reader because most people have that. It's free. And so there's a 60-page book I just created, which is in PDF format, of course. And it will teach you sort of the basics of working with PDFs using the free reader program because the latest edition of the reader program, which is um, edition or version 11, uh, lets you do things like highlight and um, create digital signatures, and it lets you search. So it lets you do a lot of things that most lawyers probably aren't even aware that they could do. So you get that that program. You can download that now. Just Google free Adobe Reader, download it, uh, and then you can get the book, which is $9.97, and that will walk you through with screenshots and so forth about how to use um, Adobe Reader. But we are going to move on from, from that discussion quickly to Adobe Acrobat, which is um, a program that comes in two versions, a standard, which costs $300, and um, oh, standard, which costs $300, and the professional version, which costs $420. So the main thing that um, Acrobat does that I think most law firms are going to want to have that they don't have is it lets you bait stamp digital documents quickly. Um, you need professional for that. It also lets you redact information. So that's we're going to talk a lot about uh, PDFs and, and Acrobat. But... The main thing that we're going to um, talk about as well is cloud computing. This is another thing that underlies what, what we're what we're going to be showing you today. So, and this is the notion that that you're, and of course most of you know this, that your information is digital, but it is digital and stored not just on your laptop, tablet, desktop, computer, or smartphone, but rather it's up in the cloud, the internet, and it's there, uh, syncing with all of your other uh, landlocked devices, and uh, that gives you the ability to back up your information very quickly and also to uh, have the information available wherever you are, whatever device you have in front of you. So that's another one of these themes for our digital lawyer. Yeah, and we'll talk about things, services like Dropbox and SugarSync and Google Drive, which are all cloud-based services that let you store documents in the cloud. Um, we'll talk about ethics, confidentiality. Um, you can't eliminate all risks no matter what you do in life, you know, but that's true with cloud computing as well. But we will talk about how to minimize or avoid certain common risks. Um, the, main th the main message really is that cloud computing, it's part of our world now, and it doesn't make sense to avoid it out of ignorance and fear. Next, we will, talking, we will be talking about email, which is essential to everyone in the modern world, I would say, but definitely essential to lawyers. Um, the main thing, I think, with email is because it's so central, because it's such an integral part of what we do, is here's where you want to set up some automated systems, some things where you think about how your workflow with email is, because you want as much to happen automatically in your email program as possible and you want to make things easy to find and easy to get to and you want to be able to have confidence that you can retrieve information out of your email system if you need to. So there's a lot of things that we're going to talk about with email. And of course the we're going to talk about the nirvana of email which is that state of inbox zero. Uh, <laughs> mythical for most, I have achieved it very briefly at some points in my life, and I'm just pleased to be able to, to say that. Yes. I'm not there now, but I, I always aspire to be there. Uh, we'll have a lot more tips on email storage, email workflows when we uh, get to that session of the course. Yep. And then we're going to talk about word processing, which is another core function for lawyers because lawyers create lots of documents, briefs, and so forth. And um, yeah, I have Microsoft Word up here because that's that's the dominant word processing program. I know a lot of lawyers still use WordPerfect. Uh, Dane is one of those people. And so there's nothing wrong with WordPerfect. Whatever system you use is great, but there are ways to set up your word processing system so that it's efficient, so that you know, you're not trying to fix little things that are bothering you all the time. And we have a couple of good um, sessions on that covering Microsoft Word for Windows and Microsoft Word for Mac so that whichever one you're using, 
you can just watch the one applicable to you. Uh, document doc automation. Yeah, document automation is, is not for all lawyers, but for lawyers who are in, uh, particularly uh, th those in the business of repeatedly generating the same sorts of documents in mostly the same sorts of cases will find great use for document automa automation. That is the ability just to have uh, information drawn from forms and from databases that relate to your cases and then to just flow that information into, into documents. Now I don't particularly use this, uh, this kind of workflow because the cases that I handle really are very different from one another. But, uh, but for lawyers who do have high volume practices or do have practices that are uh, result in very similar cases being handled over and over again, this is invaluable. Yeah, it's mostly real estate lawyers, bankruptcy lawyers. I mean, if you have a heavy form practice, then document automation is, is key. But we will talk, because I do use some of these techniques, uh, we will talk a little bit about it because it can help anywhere, you know, if you're a litigation attorney as well. Speech recognition, which is sort of a corollary of document automation. So when I say I use document automation, this is one of the things that when I really want to blast out text quickly on my Macintosh, I use Dragon Dictate for the Mac. If you're on Windows, you would be using Dragon Naturally Speaking. But this is something that there's a hurdle to get over in learning how to use it because you have to give the commands verbally, and so you have to know what the commands are. You can't be searching for them in a menu bar. But once you learn to use um, this software, and lawyers who have learned to use it say this, it, it it's amazing. I mean, you can you can blast out text at three to six times whatever your type typing speed is. So, very useful. Um, it can replace having a secretary if you're a solo lawyer. So this is something that's definitely worth taking a look at. Yeah, and I've got to admit that I uh, I have that program, uh, the Dragon Dictation program, loaded on my computer. I've just never really used it. That's going to be something that uh, I, I'm going to have to practice what I preach or what Ernie preaches <laughs> in this regard. I'm, I'm going to make it a point to try to start using some speech recognition, but I'll be the first one to confess that I don't uh, have any experience with using this, other, other than using my Siri on my Apple cell phone, which I, my iPhone, which I do all the time. Right. And I don't use it that much, but I have learned to use it in certain places, and we'll talk about where it kind of makes sense to jump in. Practice management. Now, this is an area. I mean, this could we could do a whole bunch of courses, a whole bunch of sessions on just practice management. And, practice and, for the, ma and for the record, before anybody gets the wrong idea, that is not my office, <laughs> and that is not your office. No. That slide no. is the antithesis of what we're talking about. Right. The idea is, you know, in the in the paper world, this is probably how people manage their practice. Although this fellow who has this desk does have a computer. Um, so the question is, how do you manage your practice uh, paperlessly? How do you manage it using cloud services? What kinds of things can you use um, inside a practice management program? What will it take care of? Will it manage your email for you? Will it help you with document automation? And there are a lot of choices, really. And so there are, you know, Lexus, Westlaw, all kinds of big companies have their own practice management software that they sell. Um, it's it's a very hard thing to recommend to lawyers which one that they should use because it kind of depends on where they already are. It depends on what they want to do. It depends on uh, you know somebody coming in and evaluating all that and then saying, well, here are your best choices, and then you pick one. And then the problem is once you pick one, you're never going to stop using that one and jump to something else. So it's very tricky to recommend this. But the, the central thesis for Dane and I is that Wherever you can use a cloud service, you should use a cloud service. So there are really not that many choices when it comes to practice management software that's cloud-based. I think Dane and I have tried the major ones, and um, we'll talk about some of those things. But in the realm of practice management, we also would be talking about virtual lawyering and case management. So um, case management, I'll let Dane jump in and tell you what that is about because that involves Case Map, another one of our favorite programs. It is one of my all-time favorites. Unfortunately, it is not a cloud-based program. It's a Windows-based program that uh, must reside and work from your individual computer, but it's very powerful to organize the people, the documents, the issues, and the facts that comprise your cases. 
Uh, for me, it's invaluable. I use it in every single matter that I work on. And it is uh, indispensable, at least I believe, for the paperless lawyer. And as Ernie said, we'll also talk about some of the cloud-based based practice management software, Clio, uh, Rocket Matter, My Case, to name the three leaders. But uh, Case Map is different in that it's not about managing uh, uh, or juggling all of your cases. It's about mastering each case. And we'll spend, uh, I'll spend most of the time on, on that topic. Uh, over the course of two or three sessions discussing how to use case map. Yeah, and virtual lawyering is another topic we're going we're gonna to discuss. I probably will be talking about that. You know, this is another one where we're just entering this realm where virtual lawyering is possible. I mean, we some lawyers have been doing it for a while, but I think most lawyers are unfamiliar with this concept. And you can, it, virtual lawyering could mean anything from I have no office whatsoever, I practice purely on my computer and everybody that I interact with other than when I have to go to court is done via computer. It could mean that, which is very broad and extensive. Or it could mean simply, well, I have a paralegal and I have some people that I work with, but they're not in the same place where I am, and we collaborate virtually, and then the rest of my practice is however my practice is. So it could be either one of those things, but it is definitely something that more lawyers are taking advantage of because it saves time, money, and um, and uh, helps you collaborate more efficiently with other people. E-discovery. Now, e-discovery is something that I know very little about. I haven't had the pleasure or nightmare, depending on who you talk <laughs> to, to deal with a case involving substantial e-discovery. Um, and Ernie and I are, 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 are very pleased that we have not Either one of us experienced that, or you haven't experienced one of those cases, have you, Ernie? You know, I actually, I have had some e-discovery matters, um, and they've been in small cases. I have paid attention to this, I, and I will say this about e-discovery. It is very important to at least understand, in, in a rough sense, how things can go wrong, because that's really, you know, the, the big news in e-discovery is that it used to be that discovery was never really an outcome determinative thing in the sense of if you made a mistake. Like, so if you didn't answer an interrogatory in the right time frame, I mean, you might, some bad things might happen. You might get sanctioned, but you wouldn't lose the entire case. That's not true anymore. It, it, there have been adverse inference rulings where judges have told the jury you are uh, allowed to infer, or you, you are to infer something adverse to one party because they so messed up an aspect of e-discovery that they, um, you know, basically the, the judge will say, okay, so presume uh, fraud. Well, that would be like presuming fault. So there are cases like that out there. So you need to understand kind of the basic things about e-discovery and how they tend to go wrong, and we'll talk about that. Maybe we'll even get somebody who's actually really good at this to come in as a guest lecturer and explain it. But it's important to cover, so we're going to cover it. Internet searching. Um, this is also important. I think we tend to think of searching as doing Westlaw research or Lexis research and things like that, but these days information is everywhere. It's, it's definitely on the internet, and I think lawyers need to be more proficient and understand how to find information on the internet, what kinds of information they might want to look for on the internet, and this is something I've gotten really good at just because I've had websites and I've you know looked for information to put on the websites and so forth so it's a skill I've acquired for reasons not necessarily having to do with the practice of law but it turned out that those skills actually helped me in the practice of law and I've noticed that lawyers who are skillful in this way who know how to Google for things and know how to get a sense of what's out there quickly by using Google those lawyers tend to be uh, a little more proficient um, in managing their information. I, I don't know. How, do you find that to be true, Dane? I, I do, and, and you know, you're probably thinking to yourself, Google. I, I, I do Google. I've been Googling since 1999 or whenever Google started. And, and we're not obviously going to teach you how to, how to do a very basic Google search. But there are uh, sites for lawyers to find information there uh, that, that you might not know about. And we'll give you some tips and some various sites that we find useful to, to find information. Yep. Um, also important 
And I think this is, to me, one of the things that if I could teach lawyers or make them aware of something and really get them to pay attention to it and figure out how to incorporate it in their practice of law, more than anything else, it would be this, at, le at least litigators. Because when you go into court and you're trying to persuade a judge or a jury, you're doing a lot of other things besides just persuading them. Persuading has is built on certain foundations. Number one, you need to be able to explain your position. So you, know, you can't persuade anybody unless they understand what you're saying. So they're not just going to be persuaded because you look great or you know you have a fancy suit. You have to have an explanation that makes sense to them. You have to explain complicated information a lot of times and just using your words is not the most efficient way to do it. And so the way lawyers traditionally introduce information is they put a witness on the stand, they ask them some questions, they show them some documents, and they try to get the jury to understand or the judge to understand what's going on um, when they do this. But that, that's all auditory information, and the visuals are maybe, okay, here I show you the documents. But the best way to do this is to put information up on a big screen and show the jury or the judge what you're talking about while you're talking about it. And then to learn to think about, well, if I'm talking about data, and maybe that data is in the form of, you know, you know, here you see temperatures going down, and this is related to the shuttle launch, and there was damage, and there was a tracking of as the temperature went down, they had more damage. So if you can display this kind of information and, and make it easy for people to understand it and to assimilate it quickly and then remember it for a long time, that's really, really useful. And I think that the modern lawyer needs to know how to do this because all you basically need to know how to do is how to use PowerPoint. And and perhaps even if you sometimes don't want to bring PowerPoint with you, you might want to use uh, flip charts, which are uh, I have kind of tried to make an effort to use those. Or if you're in your office, whiteboards. The point is that you've got to not just talk; you've got to show. And we'll talk about the different types of technology, old and new that will give you the ability better to show your audience what it is you're trying to persuade them to do. Yeah. And then we're going to talk about websites and marketing because that's part of practicing law is figuring out how to uh, get clients to know what kind of law you practice, to feel comfortable hiring you, uh, basically managing your online reputation because you know the most important thing that you have as a lawyer is your reputation. And this is something that Benikoff in his book talks about extensively. He says, you know, it's very important to build your reputation the right way. And that's true. But you also have a reputation online because whatever you do offline carries over online. And you should be aware of what influences your online reputation and how you can influence it so that clients can find you more easily so that they can learn about you more readily, so they can trust you more readily, and so forth. So we're going to talk about that, um, and that'll mostly involve setting up websites and so forth. Online security. Obviously, if we are recommending that you store your data up in the cloud and that you have uh, you, all of your client information on computers that are connected to the Internet, you've got to make sure it's all secure, and it would be... Uh, very neglectful of us if we were to have a whole course and not spend some time, at least one session, on online security. We'll talk about password managers. We'll talk about basic common sense and uh, phishing and, and other types of Internet scams just to, uh, now many of you know about these already, but just in an effort to, to protect your client's information and to satisfy your own ethical obligations to uh, keep your client information confidential. Yep. And also important because it lets you get out of the office, which is a good thing, and to work outside the office, which sometimes is important if you just need to knock out some quick work. Mobile. Ernie, Ernie, tell them why we didn't use the picture of me on the boat with a laptop. And that's, well, I'll tell them because yeah, tell them. I don't have a boat and I don't have time to sit on one. Yeah, but I don't have a boat either. <laughs> But this guy does, right. and it would be nice to be him. It would be. And, you know, actually I will say, though, that I um, I did once take a sailing trip, and we had Internet access, and I was able to do some work from my iPhone, 
that needed to be done. So there was some crisis, and I was able to solve the crisis because I knew how to use my iPhone to get on to my Dropbox account to email out a document that somebody desperately needed, which if I had not been able to do that, I would have felt bad for some of the trip because I knew this person was waiting for it. So mobile lawyering basically involves you know, being able to practice law when you're not in your office because you don't want to have to say, well, gee, I'm waiting on a fax. You know, I think a fax might have come in. I think i got to go in the office to see if my fax machine is spitting out a fax. You don't want to do that. You want to be able to do everything that you need to do from wherever you are if you need to work on something. And if, you're, if you don't have paper to deal with, this is another reason why being paperless is key, is if you don't have paper to deal with and you use cloud services, then mobile lawyering is just one step up from that. And then last, um, but very important, because the ABA model rules say that not only do lawyers have to pay attention to technology, but they also have to keep up with important changes. The question is, how do you keep up? And we'll spend our uh, one of our last sessions talking about how to use the Internet to keep on top of the subject matters in which you practice, and also in workflow and technology developments. So we'll talk about RSS feeders. We'll talk about... Uh, various uh, other listserv, well, not necessarily listservs, but uh, mailing lists you might join in an effort to keep abreast of developments in your substantive area and in technology. Yeah, because the thing is, it, you know, it can be overwhelming, and it definitely was overwhelming to me in the beginning, trying to keep up with all of this stuff. But I know, because Dane and I compare notes on this very closely, we're always trying to learn from each other, and we both have our little tricks for how do we bop in, quickly find out what's going on, figure out what's the most important thing to be paying attention to so that we can ignore most of the noise uh, because you don't want to spend too much time trying to figure out what is useful. So that is key. Um, we're going to show you how to do it and give you all of our secret tips on that one. So I think that basically wraps it up, right? That does. That's uh, the last uh, slide and the last uh, topic for this session. Uh, Ernie, can we tell them about the next session? Go ahead and tell them, Dane. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the next session, the one that we will post next is entitled, What's in the Tech Bag? And what it essentially is, is Ernie and I talking about the technology that we each use in uh, an effort to do all of the things that we've just talked about. And uh, it, too, is in some respects a preview uh, on the other sessions to come. Uh, but, but just to understand that it's not kind of a vain effort for us to talk about ourselves. It's just an effort to share our experience with the technology, the resources, the hardware that we're going to spend the rest of the course talking about. Yep. I think you'll find it interesting. It's kind of, it's, it, the main thing, I, you know, this is, this what's in the tech bag is probably an outgrowth of when Dane and I first started talking about you know, technology. We would get together for coffee or lunch and say, well, you know, you're doing this, how are you doing that? And that was really our way of kind of figuring all this stuff out and helping each other. And it's interesting because I've pretty much always been on the Mac side and you've pretty much always been on the Windows side, and yet there's a lot of crossover in what we do. Um, so we'll talk about that. All right, so tune in next time, and we will see you then.